How are you guys? You guys are very cute. <laughs> different shades, I like it, different hair stories. Um, my name is Hugh Robinson. I'm a comedian and I have a podcast on WNYC called Two Dope Queens. And I'm really excited to be here to talk about bail. Um, that's not a joke, seriously. Like, I don't know anything about bail, so I'm really excited to be talking with Nick and Liz and learning so much. We don't know anything about it either. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> I really, I mean, I know like a little bit of it, but it's only from, you know, like TV shows like Law and Order, or, like Orange is the New Black, or like Oz. Like, so that's like my understanding. But I'm going to say there's going to be like no murder up here tonight. So <laughs> we're hoping not. Yeah. <laughs> So what is, let's, uh, do you guys want to introduce yourselves or are you guys good? Sure. <laughs> I don't know, I want us to feel like a cozy. No, like, they look all right. I'll introduce myself. Yeah. Hi, I'm Nick Turner. I'm the director of the Vera Institute of Justice. Thank you all for coming. Uh, and I'm Liz Glazer. I'm the director of the mayor's office of criminal justice. Oh my God. And I'm on Tinder. I feel so <laughs> underqualified to be here. <laughs> But like this is but we have you surrounded. So yeah, this is very awesome. exciting. Thank you guys so much. But if there's anyone single, like holler at me. <laughs> um, so let's get into just like the basics of bail, like what it's about. Like, so someone gets arrested and then they like post them out. Uh, like you have to pay like two thousand and get out, and then you pay it, and that's it, right? Like that's the gist of it. If only it was that simple. Oh no. So. Um, <laughs> Not to make everybody run for the doors, but actually many, many cases in New York City really have nothing to do with bail. So, you know, a lot of cases come through the system in New York City. There are about 390,000 arrests every year, um, but those aren't even all bail cases. So when you, um, and, and just to sort of be clear of what those cases are, um, most of them are actually misdemeanors. About 85% of them are misdemeanors, meaning cases in which you uh, serve a year or less, arrests are felonies. Um, and of those 390,000 cases, uh, not all of them end up being bail cases. So when somebody's arrested and gets brought to a precinct, um, if the case is a relatively low level case, they can be issued by the police something called a desk appearance ticket. Uh, and we have probably about, uh, 40,000 of those desk appearance tickets a year. So by the time you get from um, being arrested, being brought to the precinct, the folks who actually end up in front of a judge to determine whether they're going to plead guilty or not guilty, what's called the arraignment stage, uh, we're now down to about 330,000 cases. Still a lot. Uh, so, so like 40,000 desk appearance tickets, and if you're not one of those lucky winners, then what happens? You're among this 340,000 that end up going to central booking. And in central booking, I guess the best way to sort of understand this is three things happen. Um, first, uh, the district attorney or the assistant district attorney uh, is going to uh, take a look at the case and decide whether or not to uh, bring a charge, and if that's the case, then they write up something called a criminal complaint. So that's step one. And while that's happening, um, you uh, encounter someone from CJA. So CJA stands for the Criminal Justice Agency. And um, if I can just pause here for a second to say that CJA, um, which is New York City's uh, pretrial services agency, is actually progeny of the Vera Institute of Justice. So Vera started back um, 55 years ago, 1961, and uh, CJA was uh, is now the sort of modern manifestation of our of the very first project that that we ran. So CJA does uh, one really important thing: is that it tries to uh, it, it conducts an interview that really um, is directed at determining whether it can make a recommendation to the court as to whether you should be uh, released or whether you're of moderate risk and, um, and or whether the recommendation is that you should be um, held in confinement. And uh, the way CJA does that work is by asking you a, a set of questions about, you know, uh, where do you live and um, 
do you have a place of work and are you enrolled in school or a, a program and do you have someone who can verify all of this? And out of that comes the recommendation. And the recommendation isn't binding, it's just really a recommendation, it's, it's advice. And so I think judges don't always uh, take the recommendations that CJA makes. Now the third and last thing that happens while you're in, in central booking is that you uh, meet up with your with your your lawyer, and um, most New Yorkers who go through central booking obviously um, are 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 poor, and so they do not have uh, the ability to hire their own private lawyers, and so they're often appointed a, a lawyer, a public defender, who will help you to prepare you for the moment um, before which you go before the judge. Um, and help you to understand what the charges are that you might be confronting and whether or not a plea deal might be in the, in the offing and um, whether or not you might have an opportunity for bail. So that was a lot. And <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, I, I like you a lot. Uh, okay, so how many cases at one time is like a public defender really juggling? Because that sounds like a there's a lot of arrests happening. So like uh, on any given day was like 20 different cases at once, 50. I don't know. I mean, so Liz, you might be better positioned to answer, but the sense that I, the, so public defenders, generally speaking in the United States, and I think the same might be, is true here in New York. Um, although they're, they are better resourced in New York, certainly than they are in other parts of the country are dealing with a huge volume of cases. And I think that most of these, cases that come up for arraignment, you know, it's like snap, 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 snap. It is, you know, 60 seconds, 90 seconds. Public defenders have a very short time Wait, to deal 60 with seconds? clients. So I, Do you so, agree with that? Do you think I'm off base? So I think that's certainly true when wow. the cases come up for arraignment. In fact, little known fact. Thank you, Phoebe. Yeah. Um, probably about half the cases um, end up going no further than arraignment either because uh, people plead to them, or because they're just dismissed outright, or because uh, they get something called an ACD, an adjournment and contemplation of dismissal, meaning the case is put off for some period of time, and if uh, you keep clean, then uh, at the end of that period, the case is just dismissed. Uh, so I think that there is quite a heavy caseload um, but it's relatively quick uh, in criminal court, which is that first um, place that the cases land. And there may be defense lawyers in the audience who can correct this, um, but I think that's basically... You have it. one lifeline, so you can actually <laughs> call out to some defense lawyer who can... I'm hoping I have more than one. <laughs> <laughs> I took all of them. They were backstage, so... Wow, okay, so... Uh, so say I come in. I've been uh, arrested for being too pretty. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, uh, for shoplifting, is that like a, a common thing that comes in? So I would come in, and then I have 60 seconds with you just to like prepare for the like. What will we prepare in that 60 seconds? Will you just like walk me through like this is what's going to happen? Like can I like what happens in that minute, minute and a half? So look, so I've only seen this on TV. Right. So, me too. You know. But so, but basically, basically three things. One is you're going going to be prepared for. Well, here's the charge that you're facing, and um, and you're the second thing that you'll be prepared for is uh, you may or may may not be able to expect a plea. The prosecutor might say we'll give you this amount of time for this case given your record, and or and then you might be looking at bail. So those are the three things. I mean, I'm sure I'm not doing it. At, you know justice, but I think at the high level, those are the, the three things that you're going to be concerned with at, the, at that time and what your, what your public defender or and lawyer is going to be sharing with you. And I think it. the interesting thing for us, since we're all here at bail, and I'm sure you're drumming your fingers thinking, so when are we going to get to it, is that sort of up to now, we've really been talking about this huge swath of cases that run, you know, kind of sluice through the system, um, but where bail is not an issue. But yeah. then we finally get to you know, the hundred, the other half, yeah. right, the 168,000 or whatever it is, yeah. um, in which now a judge has to make a decision about how to get you back to court. And that's sort of where bail or not bail or all these other options then come into play. So bail is basically just to get people to show up? 
Right. Okay. Um, especially in New York State. And New York State is actually one of four in which um, the only thing the judge can consider uh, in determining, in setting bail, uh, or the consideration that sort of drives it, is whether the person is, is a risk of coming back to court or not, not whether the person is dangerous. Oh. So, but, um, and if we just back up for a second, so even before bail is considered, there are, there are other other things that the judge can do. There's ROR, right. which is so release on recognizance. And, um, and about what, how many people get that? Thank you. Um, so interestingly, uh, New York is actually, uh, is a very heavy user of ROR, release and recognizance. Um, so about 70% of the people actually get ROR. We're about twice the rate of what Washington, D.C., which is often sort of held up as like uh, a model of kind of a, a, a jurisdiction that does release right. Um, but we're at about twice the rate of what D.C. is. Why do you think that is? Is that What does that say about New York? You know, I think, uh, you know, again, shout out to Vera. I think New York has um, really been in the forefront since the 1960s of trying to figure out um, and to really sort of have a presumption about release, not legally, but that's kind of what's in our drinking water. Um, and starting with the Vera Bail Project, the notion was, look, the point of bail is to make sure that people get back to court. So what's the best way to do that? And who's really not going to show up? Yeah. And so we talked about uh, that a lot of times that people are um, lower income that tend to be in these sort of situations. So what is like the minimum bail? Like what's the medium? Like what's the maximum kind of bail? And like in correlation to like the crime that's come up. So I mean, so I can I can speak to that, but it is a, it's a pretty remarkable thing. I mean, if you you know you start out with the number that Liz began with, which is this three hundred eighty thousand arrests in a given year and 40,000 of them get a desk, desk appearance ticket and then a bunch of people get this ACD that, you know, and then so then you have a bunch of people, 70% of them getting released on recognizance, which for you non-lawyers out there are pretty much just the judge saying, okay, I get the recommendation from CJA, uh, you're not a risk of flight, you can go just come come back at these appointed dates. So, so then we get to bail. Now, so then there are two classes of cases. There are misdemeanors and then there are felonies. And so for misdemeanors, the average bail is around, the city average is around $1,000. And for felonies, more serious crimes, the average bail is around 5000 And so, you know, uh, I think the figures are that the, that, that, 70% of misdemeanors, uh, bail is set at $1,000 or below. Um, so that just sort of gives you a sense of the range. And if you look at the felonies, um, you get about uh, a third that are below 5,000, um, a third that are between 5,000 and 7,500, and then a third that are over 7,500. So you get a sense of that range. What, what do you have to do to be the over the 7,500? Be pretty. <laughs> no. that's okay so a thousand dollars like just hearing that i'm like oh that's like not that bad like my rent costs more than that but most people can't really afford that is that true so what happens and they just like stay in, in jail the whole time until their their case happens or so that's the interesting thing you yeah know? So where do we get it wrong? We may get it wrong on both sides, right? So a judge is doing the best they can to sort of figure out what will make the person come back to court. They're saying $1,000, that seems about right for the seriousness of the crime, for what I think you can probably pay. They may think the person's walking out the door, but they can't. Mm -hmm. Similarly, they may set, set a $10,000 bail thinking you should really be in, but that may not happen. The guy may be able to pay it or his family or friends may be able to put it up. So this issue of sort of guessing on both ends is sort of is an issue and we want to be able to make sure that people aren't being held in on the, on the low end um, just because they can't um, pay bail. 
And so, you know, there are a bunch of things going on in the city now um, that are trying to kind of alleviate that. One is supervised release, which is an effort to actually figure out, you know, what the risk levels of um, people are and to give uh, the judge an option uh, when some, when they, this person really shouldn't be held in Undale of a way to release them back into the, their neighborhoods um, and to make sure that they come back to court, not because there's money hanging over them, but because somebody's calling them and saying, hey, you should show up to court tomorrow um, and reminding them and otherwise sort of monitoring to make sure that they come back. So it's kind of a guessing game a little bit in terms of like what to decide the bail is going to be on a person. Is that I, sort of like, an informed guess? Of, yeah. So as, you know, as Nick said, you know, the criminal justice agency gives guidance and tries to sort of um, give the judges a sense of, you know, where the range is. We have a very able judiciary that, you know, has been around the block and has sort of seen things. So they're relying upon their experience as well. Um, but the troubling thing is what does happen when you get it wrong? Yeah. Yeah. So what does happen if you get it wrong? Like, if you say you do the the ten thousand, you're like, oh, he's not going to be able to pay that. But then he gets the money and gets out. Like, what what happens then? Are you just like, oh, I, I got that wrong? Like, do you just so that's that that can happen. Mm -hmm. And I think you know the other piece where we can actually do something about where we get it wrong and where we care about it a lot because we don't want to be careless about liberty um, is on the low end. So. You know, about three quarters of the people who actually make bail in the end make bail within that first week of Rikers. This is sort of what colleagues of mine call meaningless jail, right? Why are they even there? Um, Wait, they go to Rikers? You get arrested at four o'clock. Yeah. The bus to Rikers leaves at six. Oh, it's like and the bus to the Hamptons. It's like, <laughs> you got to... Wow, I've taken it's it. Like, yeah, it's, it's like, like that, but not it's, as... It's just not called a jitney. Right, it's not the jitney. It's like, get on the bus. Uh, okay, wow. No, this is right. I mean, so so at court, you get bail set. What is this, like only 7% or something of people are actually able to, you know, to, wow. to pay bail at that point. And then there's this higher proportion that are able to pay it, but they've already gone to Rikers, and so then there's this challenge of the fact that they've been sent there, and then payment has to be, has to be made. Wow. But, you know, the thing that's yeah. interesting is, uh, I mean, well, there's so many things that are interesting this uh, here, but, but and, and you'll hear a little bit more about this to, um, later on in the evening, is that um, judges under current New York law actually have lots of options that are available to them other than bail. There are actually nine of them. Um, I won't tell you all nine because can't um, and it's not so so important but there's a but the two that are used the most so first of all one thing that a judge has to do is when they set bail is they have to offer two you have to offer two options for um, for paying bail and so the ones that are used like 99% of the time are cash you want to you know you want to be released you got to put up the cash $500 bail we need $500 or something called um, insurance company bail bond. And that's what, you know, if you go by many of the criminal justice, the criminal courts, you see these bail bonds places. And those are uh, insurance brokers in a way. And what they will do is they will put up the money. And what you have to do as a defendant is, is to pay 10% of whatever that amount is. If it's $5,000, you pay 500. And as it is in any other insurance, you pay that, you get released you never get that back. It's not like you ever get to have that back. So that's, but those are the most widely used things. But then there are a whole bunch of others. There's are there are secured bonds where um, either the individual or family and friends can say, "I'm going to put up collateral in order to get release." There's partially secured where they can say, "I'll put up 10% of this amount and." And that's, you know, and that's essentially the thing that will keep me from, you know, keep me returning to court. And then the last two things are unsecured bond, where the judge can say, we think you're good for it. You can come, you can, you know, 
just come back. And if you don't come back, then what? we're going then we're gonna come after that amount. And then you can use a credit card. So there are nine different ways in which the legislation allows for judges to do other things, but right now the convention in the city is really to 99% of the time is to use cash and an insurance bail bond. But there's one where you can just be like, oh, I think you'll, you'll be good, like you're good, and then just, just peace out? That's right. But you have to okay. remember, everyone is getting a CJA mm -hmm. recommendation. So everyone is, you're looking at community ties and, you're, and, and whether someone is a risk of flight or likely to return. So a recommendation comes with everyone, and that's the whole point of that instrument, is to say there's ties to school, there's ties to family, there's a address, there are people who can verify it. We feel certain that you're gonna come back. Yeah, but I don't, like, I don't know about you guys, but I know none of my neighbors. I never wanna talk to them. <laughs> that's like everyone in New York, but I, so it's like, you know, they're going to say I don't have community ties. And I was like, well, who does? You have community ties. You have a you have a paycheck. You yeah. have a place of you have a, a place where you live. You have a place where you work. That stuff is verifiable. Yeah, I think. And that and um, and someone can probably call your moms and say, yes, that's true. Phoebe has uh, this great you know, has this, this great podcast and she gets paid by X. <laughs> That's why so. you start a podcast. So in case you get arrested, you're like, <laughs> NPR guys. <laughs> well, but, but like, the, I guess the point that I'm making is that it's not, you know, that it's not just that people are like, yeah, you look all right. See ya. I mean, right. there's, these are, you know, these are um, instruments that are really used to, you know, that have masses of data behind that support whether someone is in fact a risk of, you know, is, is a risk of flight or can really reliably be counted on to, to return. Wow. This is so exciting. Isn't it? Yeah, I like kind of like want to get arrested just to see like how much they think I, okay. Just me. <laughs> just me. Okay. Um, so I guess I just, so in terms of bail, so if someone can't pay it, they go to Rikers until their case goes back to court and usually that's a week or it could be longer or so if bail is set mm -hmm. um they can try and make it uh at rikers and a very very large proportion of people who make bail make it in that first week okay. um if you don't make it within the first week the likelihood is you're not going to make it and maybe the judge intended that you stay in mm -hmm. um but you know, an application can be made at any time to change your bail. Yeah. And I know you you mentioned earlier that you're um, like trying. To, you guys are like working on a way to to help people, not just like staying in bail and be like be gone. Like, are there like counselors? Like, I know this is like going a little bit off the topic of bail, but I'm just curious. Like, what is where are the other like supplementing ways that you're like trying to help people? Is it counselors? Is it what exactly happens? Yeah, so I think, you know, we have a big focus right now on that first week um, at Rikers and what are the ways in which we can make sure that people actually, um, you know, that there aren't these unintended consequences. You know, do you have access to an ATM machine just to pay the money? Um, are there better ways that we can sort of figure out, can you hold the bus a little bit longer <laughs> um, to make sure that people can get in touch with their families? Um, so there are a lot of sort of different pieces. There are a lot of physical impediments to just paying bail where you want to avoid those unintended consequences. And then, you know, there are other things. So, you know, I mentioned the supervised release program. That's a really important way to make sure that people aren't in that position to begin with. If you're, you know, if the judge has assessed your in such a way that, now I'm going to have to talk really loud. Oh, it went on again. Um, that you can be released without um, a money money bond being set. That's a great way um, to have people come back to court, and we see that people do come back to court, you know, uh, without money bail. Uh, another thing that's sort of in the works in New York City is the City Council has uh, suggested having a bail fund set up. This is something that both um, Bronx and Brooklyn uh, defenders have uh, have done in those two boroughs uh, where 
a separate fund, not your family, not a bail bondsman, um, puts up an, an amount of uh, you know cash for you to get out. It has to be under two thousand dollars. That's by state statute, um, and I uh, and that's shown very very high returns. About ninety five percent of the people come back on that. So. Um, so we think that there are a lot of opportunities, a lot of flexibility to make sure that people who are low risk um, should not be in Rikers. Well, so Phoebe, can yeah. I just say, because uh, yes. your question was interesting, because you said, well, you know, are there counselors, you know, sort of wondering, well, what's the human intervention that you're doing here? But I think it's really important to remember that at this stage in the criminal process, um, you're presumed innocent. So the question is, how can we create a system through, so you know Liz's answer is you say, well no they're ATM machines you know like, what <laughs> yeah. you know but but you know so how do you make when bail is set what are the things that can be do that can be done to make sure that you can have your liberty um, and and what are the ways of sort of making that most possible so ATM machines if someone has the ability to pay then they can do that then they don't have to get on the bus to Rikers pretrial supervision um, giving people, uh, you know, which which provides sort of a very light supervision and reminds people that they need to come back to court. So it's not necessarily so much about intervening in people's lives at that moment as, as, it, as it is. You want to help people do exactly what Liz said, which is return to court and make sure that people who should not be in Rikers because they aren't a risk of flight and simply are unable to pay, that there are other means that are available to them, either through their credit card or ATM machine or through these bail funds, which will cover them and, and allow them to be released. So, so if a lot of people, if we know going into this, uh, most people can't afford the bail that's going to be given to them, can't the judge just lower the bail to what they think the person can afford or what it seems like they can afford? Like, I, I don't know if that's like too naive, but I think that wouldn't that be helpful to people? Well, or? Interesting, like the judge does not have information in front of him or her that gives him that, you know, CJA doesn't ask about uh, income. Um, so I think it's really, it's, it, that is a difficult call to make. So unless the system has changed in some way, um, to accommodate that and to have that information, the judge isn't going to be able to gauge that. Gotcha. Okay. Um, well, do you think that if we, let's say we're in a fantasy land where we got rid of bail, do you think that would just mean no one would come back to court? Like, how effective is bail actually in getting people to come back to, to court? Or is it just, this is like the only way that we've done it, so this is the way we're going to keep doing it? Or does it seem that it is actually... So I think that's the $64,000 question, or probably more, yeah. right? Um, and we see that people come back to court probably because of money, and also because of love. It's both love and money, yeah. right? You know, my mom put the money up, and so I'll come back. Um, or because I just think I should come back to court. So the 73 percent of the people who are released on their own recognizance with nothing just to go, they come back to court for the most part. Um, and so I think that's sort of the big question of whether money bail is really necessary or not. Yeah. Could there be something else, in, I, like I don't know the answer to this, but could there be something else instead of money that you think could would entice people to come back? to the court to, to face up to their cases? Or uh, I don't know, maybe there's yeah. not, but. I mean, I think it's, you know, you, we then descend or ascend into sort of those gauzy senses of yeah. people's sense that, you know, the system is fair, um, I will be treated fairly, and therefore I will return. You know, that sense that people have confidence in the justice system. Um, and that has to be the bedrock of what ultimately pulls people back. It's why you stop at a light at three in the morning, even though there's no cop there. Yeah. Right. And that same principle has to be imported into our justice system. Do you feel like um, most of the people who are in this, do you think they're like distrustful of the justice system or do you think like it's actually working for them or in terms of like when the bail situations happen? That's it. Oh, hi. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, 
Yeah, no. <laughs> it was a way to get attention. Yeah. Very good. It was so good. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so we have to wrap. Do you, did you have anything else on your, your, your PowerPoint? Like, I don't. Like a wolf or any, like, sort no, of, like, I, you know? <laughs> that would like, be. sound effects? I didn't know. Like an I, avatar. I, yeah. I just yeah, didn't want to know. Or, like, a picture of, like, me and Michael Fassbender, because he's my future husband. Um, anything like that? No? No, but next time I will have yeah, that. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we have to, to, to wrap up here. Um, so... Fail is necessary-ish, I think is the overall, right? Sort of? No. <laughs> oh, that's great. Okay. But it, but it is the thing that we are operating under it is at the... the it's what well, we're operating under right yeah. now. The, the, I mean, you know, we won't repeat ourselves because we already got the one yeah. minute time. But I think yeah. I would just say to the audience, pay attention to the rest of the program and to what you hear about pretrial supervision and what you hear about other modes of release right. and judge for yourself. Great. Thank you. Do you have any final words or comments? I think that is the question. Yeah. Is there any other way to get people back to court? Oh, so I asked a good question. Hey. No. Uh, all right. Well, thank you so much for educating me and all of us. This is like fantastic. And uh, all right. Great. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you.